Hi, I'm John Pringle. I'm a professor in the Department of Genetics at the Stanford University School of Medicine. I have spent most of my scientific career since I was 22 years old studying fundamental problems of cell biology and yeast cells. Now, the particular problem that I fell in love with uh, after working on several other things first was the set of issues around spatial organization in yeast, how yeast cells grow in a polarized fashion and organize themselves actually to divide a mother cell from, from her daughter cell. The current major interest of our lab, which is to study basic issues of coral biology using a small uh, experimentally tractable sea anemone as a surrogate for the corals that we're really most interested in. And we're doing this both in the hopes of learning interesting basic things about coral biology, but also of discovering things that would be useful in the context of coral conservation, which is incredibly important to people because of the many benefits that coral reefs bring to communities of people around the world. One of the things that's been really critical in uh, doing fundamental cell and molecular biological studies with model organisms has been the use of genetically well-defined strains so that experiments done in one laboratory can be compared directly to experiments done in another laboratory because you know that people are working on exactly the same thing. Uh, this has never been true in the coral field and it's an advantage we hope to bring with Aptasia because of Aptasia's rapid asexual reproduction. Uh, we have large populations of these different lines now and we're, we're happy and in fact delighted to distribute them to other laboratories in the interest of promoting the general use of genetically well-defined strains in this field. Aptasia are found all over the world. They're growing in most oceans. They're actually very common in aquariums and they're actually considered pest nuisance species. The Aptasia in general are very hardy they survive in high fluctuations of salinity, high fluctuations in temperature, but it also is difficult to expand the population because it requires a lot of resources. Our facilities include two uh, seawater systems, one for the symbiotic anemones and one for the aposymbiotic anemones. And we also have growth chambers where we can regulate and monitor the light intensity and the temperature. And we feed them brine shrimp on a regular basis so we're able to keep the aposymbiotic anemones alive even without the algae. And currently we have over thousands of individuals in our main clonal population, the CC7. We have our regular CC7s, which are pretty robust um, when it comes to heat. We have our CC7s with other strains and they actually do not tolerate the heat as well. Aptasia are sensitive depending on the type of algae that they have, that they're in symbiosis with at the time. Uh, right now, the specific bleaching experiments that we're really focusing on is looking at um, CC7 with its native algae, um, CC7 with another clade A, CC7 with a clade B. And then we're also comparing that to our Hawaiian anemones where the clade B algae actually originated from. Basically what we've been doing a lot of is actually quantifying the amount of algae that's in the anemones. We use the guava flow cytometer um, because it does, it allows us to do things one high throughput. We can look at 96 samples at once, but it also, it counts and it factors in the red fluorescence that we get from the chlorophyll from the, from the algae. We are trying to understand the, the mechanism of coral uh, symbiosis and coral bleaching. So, um, but you know, the coral system, they are complicated. One coral may contain different types of symbiodinium. So we think it's critical to set up or uh, build up a system um, which is just uh, use the, uh, the host and the one kind of symbiodinium. Basically, we isolate the the algae, the Symbaldinian cell from the host and then um, purify. Right now we have, uh, we have um, five axinic strains. Um, they are uh, in different clades. You can even see the difference within one clade because we have different species within one clade. Now the big attraction of Aptasia uh, as I mentioned before, is its experimental simplicity. The organisms are a convenient size, they're soft, so you can grind them up to extract things from them, you can squish them on a microscope slide to look at them under the microscope. 
Um, you can grow them in very large numbers because they grow pretty fast and they reproduce asexually, so you can get large numbers of uh, genotypically identical individuals, which is very important for maintaining continuity of work and, and replicability of work between laboratories. So I'm working on assembling the Aptasia palata genome and transcriptome. Assembling these transcriptomes has been kind of an evolving process. So we have two assemblies. One is the aposymbiotic anemones transcriptome and one is the symbiotic anemones transcriptome. To do this, um, these assemblies, we're actually using a new sequencing technology. And this has really revolutionized the way you can do molecular biology because basically in the course of a week, you can get more sequencing data than you could get in the entire human genome project that was done in 2000. So one of the experiments we're doing, of course, is we're taking the anemones, both symbiotic and aposymbiotic ones, and we're exposing them to heat stress. And then we're looking to see what genes are now turned on. That gives you an idea of what sort of stress the animal is undergoing at the cellular level. And so we're looking for those sorts of compensatory changes in aptasia as well. In the Pringle Lab, we've been working on developing a lot of basic tools that um, you need to sort of work out a, or to get a model organism up and running. So we've done genetic tools and tools for spawning, um, but one thing we don't have is a way to manipulate the organism genetically. One way to do that, which works really well in both model organisms and some non-model organisms, is to use RNA interference. So what RNAi is, is it's a way to shut down a gene in the animal. And the way you do this is that you introduce a special kind of RNA into the animal, and then the animal recognizes this RNA, and then shuts down the gene that has the same sequence as the RNA. We've been working on mixing in the special kind of RNA with agarose, which then solidifies into these little beads. And so if you mix in a little bit of food, the anemone will think that it's edible, and it will, you can see it wrap it up in its tentacles and swallow it and keep it in its mouth. And what we hope is going on during this time is that as it's sort of sucking the food out of that agarose bead, it's also taking up some of that special kind of RNA and getting it into its cells. And that's sort of how we find out how genes work, is we break them, and then we see what went wrong in the animal. My main interest in Aptasia research is to find out or elucidate the molecular mechanisms of the establishment of coral symbiosis and maintenance during larval stages. I also would like to understand how the environmental changes that we are facing today, like for example the increase of um, seawater temperature or the reduction of the, the, the pH, affects the efficiency of symbiosis establishment and maintenance, so how environmental factors impact this really important process. And so I think that Aptasia pallida is a really good model system to analyze symbiosis establishment as well as maintenance during these early stages because we can produce larvae in the lab under controlled conditions and we can infect them with different strains of the algae and then basically use modern molecular biology tools to really analyze the underlying principles of this symbiosis establishment and maintenance. Yeah, with Aptasia, people have been trying to develop this into a model system, but we haven't been able to get them to spawn, which is a really important thing in the lab. And so people had worked on this for decades, a long time, and Santiago Perez, who is a postdoc in our lab, finally worked out all of the details. So we've been able to use the asexual reproduction, really, we've been able to exploit it to get all of these uh, different individuals for our experiments, but we also want the sexual side because then we can start to do mutations, genetic crosses, and all of these other experiments to try to look at some of the patterns that we're interested in and also to follow uh, anemones through the generations. And so that's what we're working on now. I've been working on this particular immune pathway for a long time, and it's been very difficult because we have to establish a lot of the tools ourselves. But now we have really good tools. We have these fluorescent proteins that can detect things. And, and I've been pretty excited about that because I really think it's, it's an it's a new way to look at a very old system. So sea anemones and people are separated by millions of years of evolution, but it's so surprising that they actually have a lot of the same proteins that we have. And it seems like they might use them in the same ways to detect pathogens, but it seems like maybe they also use them in different ways. So there, there is a lot of communication that we know must happen between the symbiont and the host, but we don't really know the nature of that communication. So we don't know what proteins or small molecules are involved. 
And so what I'm interested in then with this establishment of symbiosis is if we have immune systems that are in place for our bodies to recognize bad things and get rid of them and ignore all of the good things, we don't really know how that works in a symbiosis situation where a good thing might be needed to come into the cell and remain. Well, part of the fascination to me is the interesting biology that hasn't been studied effectively by other people. But uh, it was clearly a motivation also, the thought that by understanding, contributing some basic understanding of how the coral organism works, how the animal interacts with the alga that provides it with most of its energy in, in real life, we might discover things that would be useful to people working on coral conservation. So our, our hope with the Acacia system has been to bring the, the kind of experimental rigor to the coral cell biology field that we've seen in the biomedical field as a result of work on, on tractable systems there. Not all of the important work in biomedicine has been done on humans. In fact, I would say a relatively small fraction of it has. Most of it has been done in, in simple experimental systems. And that's what we're trying to do with Aptasia and the corals. We're sure that most of what we learn in Aptasia will be directly applicable to corals and therefore be very illuminating about coral biology and how corals function as, as organisms. Uh, we can only hope that as time goes by, our accomplishments with this system will justify being displayed along with the other great discoveries that have been made here over the years. Uh -huh.